Hey guys, welcome to a very special segment. Um, this is going to be a little podcast. I'm talking about heavy metal music. And I've got a very special guest here, my friend and my former bandmate as well, Dr. Bevan Ware. Hello, Bevan. G'day, how are you? Good. How's it going? Oh, end of a end of a day. That's good. Good to talk to you. Uh, likewise, I, I like your little studio in the background. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have a studio like that as well. Um, so, really, um, music is such an important part for a lot of people, and uh, I'm a metalhead, and I, I listen to rock, hard rock, and heavy metal music, and 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 this is what this channel is all about. And I just decided, hey, I'll um, um, talk to Bevan about his inspirations, you know, the kind of bands that um, inspired him to play bass and do a lot of other things as well, like musically. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things I remember clearly that Bevan introduced me to was his band, Lamb of God. Um, I, I can't remember which song Bevan played for me, but it was off... Ashes of the Wake album, and mm. um, I heard that song and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And since then, I've become a huge Lamb of God fan. So, and that was about sixteen, seventeen years ago, I think. Uh, it's a long time ago. Yeah. So, so Bevan, my question to you is like, uh, this is not an interview. This is a podcast, guys. Um, why don't you tell us? about your musical influences and, you know, what got you listening to heavy metal music? Yeah, well, I, I certainly didn't start start with Lamb of God, of course. Yeah, um, yeah I was just thinking about this. You know, I, I probably bought my first CD when I was 13. Um, and that was, that would have been Queen, you know. All right. Um, but, and, and so, so how did I get there and, um, from there. Um, so what was I doing before that? Well, you know, if, if you're living with your parents, of course, as, as you do when you're yeah. a kid and, you know, young teenager, you're exposed to, to their music. And so my mum never listened to any music, yeah. nothing, wow. not at all. Mm. Uh, but my dad was like massive into, well, we would call it classic rock now, but of course when, when he was growing up it was just rock, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and so he was massively into the Beatles, like, like so many were. But also like um, Dire Straits and uh, Simon and Garfunkel and oh, yeah. some of this real classic kind of thing. So I guess that's what I kind of like started out from, that kind of real solid kind of like classic rock background. And I think that, you know, you know, and, and I still uh, kind of even enjoy playing those songs. So um, we had kind of a, uh, a Christmas band at at work with 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 some of the guys yeah. and and they were sort of from that era and so and that's what we we're playing and, and certainly playing bass on that era of songs is is it's actually like kind of fun because it's really clear and you know the bass is like a very very clear like instrument in and and of itself and you know just that classic band structure of bass guitar lead guitar yeah. and and acoustic drummer right yeah <clears throat> yeah so so i guess that's where i started from but but yourself i mean you kind of had a different situation growing up well a little bit similar i mean um i guess my my, my parents had a a copy of michael jackson's uh tape uh, like a cassette tape that is um and there was even um i think it was uh yeah, some other ABBA, ABBA music, you know, they, they had a copy of that as well. And so in my early days, like, I I really liked Michael Jackson's stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. And when I started to, whoops, when I started to get a little bit older, um, um, I realized that I, I need to listen to something which is more guitar-based and... Uh, my very first album that I actually picked, and I say pick based on the cover of a cassette tape. Um, this was many moons ago. 
um, was Poison's live album, Swallow This Live. Mm -hmm. And and I remember coming home and uh, rocking it out and I'm like going, yeah, this is it. But when I finished listening to it, I was like, yes, this is it. But there's something which is missing. Um, and I just couldn't tell what it was. And, and prior to actually listening to a lot of music, I was actually reading a lot of uh, music magazines like Guitar World and um, Hit Parader, Circus Magazine. Uh, these were mainly hard rock and uh, metal magazines. And they would always be talking about Guns N' Roses, you know, because this was mm -hmm. back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And Guns N' Roses was very big back then. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I want to give these guys a try and I remember when I got my mom to buy me my very first Guns N' Roses cassette tape um, and I played it and immediately my jaw dropped and you know like going back when I was thinking about after listening to Poison's album there's something else I want that was it Guns N' Roses was it for me so yeah huge influence and then mm -hmm. afterwards, it was pretty much like, now I want to listen to something more heavier. Guns N' Roses is still my number one favorite band, but I knew that I wanted to listen to something more heavier, and then and then came Metallica, Anthrax, and Megadeth, and uh, immediately I fell in love with thrash metal. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my little... Yeah, history. yeah, it's interesting. So, and did you have any <coughs> kind of stray from that because uh, certainly my first kind of few years um maybe that's kind of like the 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 teenage thing where you like rebel yeah. against you know stuff and and what your parents so i um you know listen to a bunch of different things and some weird stuff and um you know alt rock and yeah other things and i'm just kind of like looking through some of my old um albums here and i realize that one thing i did um, was by like the soundtracks to movies. So this is like oh, the yeah. uh, Mortal, Mortal Kombat, Kombat movie. Nice. And so I obviously went to the God knows when this was. Um, went to this Mortal Kombat movie and then loved the music and then and then bought the soundtrack. Nice. And so I, I I don't have the other notes, but I remember there was like an interesting mix of like some really good uh, metal bands like Filter, or Crystal Method, mm. um, and they they did kind of like collabs with each other and even with some kind of like um like techno stuff like there was mixes and stuff yeah. so that was just kind of like a interesting kind of like rounding um you know the the experience and stuff as well yeah but i remember um <clears throat> when you you know telling the story about you know you you heard something for the first time and it was wowed by it um you know back in those days you know you couldn't really well, you could go into the record store, couldn't you? And you, you'd like put on your headphones and you'd like listen to the, the thing. That's correct. But sometimes I didn't even do that. No. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to buy that one. Yeah. I remember buying um, the Crash Test Dummies oh, yes, album. And so they, they're, they're kind of like alt yep. rock. I remember that um, album. And also, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember one of the other ones that it was. It slipped my mind right now. Um, Blind but Melon? I put it on. Uh, no, no, it's a, a different band. It'll it'll come to me. I can. Okay. The funny thing is, like, I can remember like the exact color <laughs> yeah, of the color. CD because I would have taken that out and played it. Yeah. Um, but it was something going on, and it was the first track. Oh, this uh, maybe it was. Maybe it was Crash Test Dummies Worms Life. I don't know actually. Um, What's that? But anyway, one, yes. one of them I put it on, and the opening track I thought, oh man, this sucks. <laughs> it was like, and I was yeah. like, oh man, why did I buy this album? This sucks. And then it just like launched this like real hard, you know, metal rift. It was like <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I don't think it was this album, but yeah. It, and that was just like the shocking kid because I'd like really cranked up my thing because yeah. I couldn't hear it because it was sounding dumb. Yeah, and th those kind of experiences, like that kind of power of that, you know, just just hardcore, yeah, like uh, guitar riff. What was that album that you were just showing? Because I couldn't see. I'm not wearing my reading glasses. Oh right, this is uh, Crash Test Dummies. Ah. Uh, a Worm's Life. Ah, right. Um, um, yeah, I think one of the early ones. Yeah. L look, for me, it's like... Uh, I think album covers have played such a massive role for me 
that many a times I, this is like prior to MP3 days, that I would just mm. be going to a record store and uh, looking at a cover of a, a of the album and getting fascinated by it and just knew that there was something interesting happening in it. Um, obviously, I had my 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 theory uh, covered because I was reading about all these different bands, so I knew like, all right, these are the rock bands and these are the metal bands, and but. What I just didn't know was that, hey, what what does the music sound like? Because unless you would listen to radio, and which I've always hated, I've never been a fan of listening to radio. And um, so for me, it was just, yeah, all right, this is also prior to the internet days, pre-internet days. So album covers fascinated me big time. And to this day, even when I had this option of going to iTunes and listening to samples, I still like you know a good album cover. I look at it and I'm like, I think this is gonna be a good album. <laughs> Very naive way of looking at things, but many a times it actually works for me. So, because a lot of effort gets put into album covers and artwork because they are the artist is trying to actually portray a certain message. Um, and there's, there's some sort of a theme associated with it. Uh, so, yeah. Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, there's a lot of thought put into it. Yeah. Mm. So. Um, and now now you're just online of a little JPEG of the <laughs> of something. <laughs> I know. So what, what bands are you uh, listening to these days or in the last month or two? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually kind of going back. And, uh, yeah, listening to some of the old stuff again. And I just kind of, like, pick a, a theme, like, I've, you know, created... Because uh, it's all... I've got all my CDs all ripped in into digital Yeah. Uh, now. So, you know, I, I could, you know, create something like uh, New Zealand music of the 90s. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and I, and I just listen to stuff like that. Just kind of, um, yeah, sort of, kind of like create my own little radio station or, or whatever. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then sometimes it's just kind of what the yeah what the mood kind of um, captures you. Any particular and, band? Yeah. That you're into? Yeah. So I was just thinking about like the New Zealand stuff, and so there was um, band um, uh, Headless Chickens and uh, <laughs> Head Like a Hole. Uh, I was obviously going for the H's. Um, yeah, and yeah, they just kind of capture that um, that rawness of uh, the sound so you know it wasn't overproduced at all uh, yeah. it was kind of like you know it reminds me you know back when we were playing um you know rock club gigs or yeah. you know just this just like those indie things in the small like basement uh studio yes. room of like the pub or something yeah. like that they just they kind of like have that kind of just feel of people who just like love music and and doing it for the music rather than like thinking, oh yeah, man, this is going to get me, you know, big dollars radio yeah. airplay and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. There's uh, so many people out there who actually complain about overproduction, and and I, to some extent I get it because sometimes I do listen to an album and it's so overproduced. Um, but I, I guess for me, like the most important thing is like as long as the music sounds great. Um, then it's okay if it's overproduced. Um, but if it sounds shitty, then yeah, then I'm not going to be too interested in it. Uh, like Judas Priest, for example, like a few years back, they released an album, Redeemer of Souls, and I don't know what they did to the uh, sound recording. Um, it just didn't sound good. And same with mm. Metallica's Death Magnetic, you know. It was clipping yeah, throughout yeah. and, you know, and stuff like that. I, I mean, you know, Metallica really pisses me off. And nowadays, like, you, I love thrash metal, but Metallica hasn't done thrash metal since the 80s. Let's put it this way. And, yeah, I, so it's okay to experiment, I guess, but there should be, like, a little threshold to make everybody happy. Well, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned Metallica because I think... 
that was probably the band that got me into metal. Yeah. But through probably one of their most uh, hated like <laughs> albums, oh, no. the Black Album. All oh, right. When they transitioned from that kind of style into their more modern style. Um, but you know that was the radio friendly thing, and I got listened to that. And then of course I was well, let's listen to their back catalog, yeah. and that's when you get you know like the real, real proper thrash metal and stuff. And from there, I guess that's where I got out into you know Megadeth and yeah. Slayer and all those other ones from, yeah. from that era. Well, it's kind of like same with me as well. You know, like Metallica kind of like kicked off uh, for me. Uh, a lot of the metal stuff and did that for a lot of people and black album is actually a good album i, I love it like I, I love the first half of black album to be honest uh and then from there i discovered more bands like anthrax and megadeth and and mm-hmm. slayer of course you know so it was all thrash metal stuff yeah but um so did metallica get you uh, inspired to play bass guitar as well I don't think so. I, I I'm not quite sure what. And you know, actually, if if I think about it, I wonder if it was really that original, that kind of classic rock stuff mm. that you can um, hear it, and it forms a, like a more different instrumental part of the music. And now, you know, I can go back and listen to uh, the heavier stuff and, and, and pick out the bass and see where it goes yeah. and stuff. But yeah, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it came from um, that more modern metal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So who's your favorite bass player? Well, you know, I, I think it depends on um, style. So, you know, of course, someone like Cliff Burton... Yeah. Um, you know, Metallica's first uh, basis yep. is 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 amazing. Absolutely. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot in uh, different styles. Like John Entwistle from The Who is mm. is really incredible as well. And and even now, I'm going to kind of go to this classic rock stuff. But even like someone like Paul McCartney oh, yeah. uh, is 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 actually like quite a good uh, bass player. He's he's overshadowed by of course of his other <laughs> other talents as well. Um, but probably the best one, uh, and, I, and I don't, and I can't remember his name, but I'm just thinking of the bands that I've seen live, uh, up and close in this kind of thing that I was talking about, this sort of basement thing. There's a, a band, New Zealand band called uh, Cripple Mr. Onion. Oh, and, yes. And uh, they're a kind of like a real, uh, kind of like a thrash kind of yeah. sound, like a um, very complex um yeah metal sound and they all use uh, like multi string like i think it's like an eight string uh, bass and you know those 12 Nuts. string guitars and stuff yeah. like that and they're all over the place so yeah that, that in terms of like my like personal experience it would probably be that band oh yeah nice and you yourself actually learn from a professional uh recording artist uh, a bass player called brent uh yeah, so, um, yeah, when I yeah decided to pick up bass, um, so I'm in uh, West Auckland. Mm. Um, <laughs> West <which> is, <laughs> Yeah, kind of, yeah, known, known for metal music and, and, and that kind yes. of thing. Um, and dr- drugs and all sorts of other stuff. And you live in the but, western suburbs right now as well, so. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and so, of course, I just went to whatever the local, my nearest guitar store, right? Yeah. And yeah, and I was just chatting to the guy, and we're talking about buying the bass and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and then he looked kind of, kind of familiar. Yeah. Anyway, and, and I figured out this, this is Brent Fox, huh. who's the bassist of the uh, West Auckland band um, Eight Foot Sativa, Eight Foot Sativa. which at that time was like uh, incredibly, like a very popular, like almost, m- almost mainstream popular yeah. uh, metal band. And they were like uh, death metal incredibly bands. popular. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, and then anyway, it turned out like I started getting lessons from him. So coming from, you know, just no practical musical experience. Uh, yeah, <laughs> learning from one of the best, um, yeah, uh, bass, heavy metal, yeah. uh, bass guitarists. Yeah. And I remember like, uh, well, uh, you and I used to work together and, um, and at that point we were looking for a bass player because a bass player just left. We were just starting a new band and, 
uh, and I was just talking to you about it. I was like, oh, I'm looking for a bass player. And, and, and I still remember you said to me, like, hey, I, I'm learning how to play bass or I play bass. <laughs> and you said something along those lines. And I was like, perfect, you're in. Um, yeah, that, and this was probably my extreme confidence because I think I'd only just been learning for like two weeks or something. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was great because uh, your your bass playing became an integral part of Shadow Shadow Dreams. You know, that was our band, and and then um, you also had a very um, well, our vision was quite similar. We wanted to play heavier stuff, and um, towards the end of our little run up. Uh, you were actually composing um, heavier bass lines um, in some of the song titles. I'm not going to name them right now, but um, you came up with an awesome bass line, which is actually one of my favorite Shadow Dream songs, you know. It's called Shut the Dash Up. So, um, yeah, I, I love it. And it's got a very groovy, <laughs> That's right. very groovy bass line to it. And... Um, and anyone that I've played that and song to, they just they just comment on your bass line. They're like, wow, this is actually pretty cool. Somebody even said like it kind of sounds like Cypress Hill. And I was like, actually, that's true. Hmm. I was just remembering um, yeah, what that song was about. And it was sort of like that um, <laughs> yeah. office <laughs> situation. Yes, yeah. we were in the same office <laughs> and there were these two chicks. And one chick just kept on talking about her cat. And the other chick kept on talking about her husband, and we're just like trying to focus and work on our computers, and uh, we're just like, you know, shut the heck up, you know, I didn't say it to them. <laughs> and Bevan and I would just, excuse me, Bevan and I would just um, went for our afternoon tea break, and we literally pinned down uh, the whole lyrics for the song, and um, and then he just came up with the riff, and it just, yeah, fit perfectly. Um, and all inspired from Metallica and Eight Foot Steven and Brent and, 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 and my background with Guns N' Roses, Megadeth and everything. It's all coming together. It's amazing how all these uh, musical compositions come together. Um, when I was reading uh, Dave Mustaine's autobiography and, you know, he talks about like some of the music that he listens to uh, is something a metalhead wouldn't even go close to. You know, he goes, he's listening to stuff from the the 60s and even beyond that sometimes. And he goes, but it's the melody which I've extracted from there and kind of uh, extrapolated that melodic elements into the metal, the thrash metal that he plays now. And, um, and it's, yeah, and, and that's what, yeah, it's very important sometimes. No, definitely. Like, I, I think metal even even death thrash i think it's more musical and closer to say classical music than like some of this pop stuff that's just so kind of manufactured and you know doesn't have that yeah um you know kind of soul to it and it's just right. more kind of musical yeah yeah it's so funny because uh you just mentioned that and i got reminded because i was uh, at a presentation today and somebody was giving a talk uh, a, a science talk and, and they were talking about birds and how they've realized that um, how this research been done that um, certain birds with um, poor uh, singing the way birds chirp and do all their singing uh, the poor quality of that um, and they were referring to it as like um, if there's a poor quality of the bird song uh, it's also normally shorter and and okay. immediately I thought about, huh, the only thing which is poor quality and of shorter length are radio tunes. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's only a metalhead would think, you know, because for us, uh, radio crap is just not good, you know. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see radio play um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in Oof, uh, yeah. full glory. <laughs> What an amazing track. And you're a huge fan of Iron Maiden too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, love Iron Maiden. So we're actually coming close to our little podcast. Um, I cannot really do a very long podcast yet because my camera is going to shut down. But uh, I'd just like to say thank you for uh, being on my channel and uh, 
It's great listening to other people's stories and just metal testimonies. You know, um, I've got a, uh, we actually have a, a, a friend, um, uh, Delane, you know, who was also the guitar player of our band. And um, he inspired me with a lot of his stories back in the days, you know, he talked about seeing Ronnie James Dio and just seeing uh, Steven Adler of Guns N' Roses and a lot of these other bands and and those stories were just so fascinating you know and 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 I, and I love listening to people people's stories and so thank you so much for sharing your stories um and uh yeah I hope um we can let's see how this podcast is going to do and maybe there's going to be additional things and more guests coming to this little segment of my channel as well uh, but it's, for the time being it's just going to be a very uh, special edition podcast segment uh, so thank you so much for watching this and um, if you're new to my channel if you haven't subscribed make sure to subscribe and hit that bell button so you'll be notified every time I post a new video take care